I was afraid of this. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone was going to say everything I wanted to say and say it really well. <laughs> and I'm up here with like amazing revolutionaries, which I'm so privileged to be here. And thank you so much to the organizers. So thematically, I think the things I want to say have been covered to some degree. I'd like to begin with a quote by Jean-Paul Sartre when he says, like all dreamers, I mistook disenchantment for truth. And I realized this during my experience in Occupy. We talk about raising the consciousness of the people, the workers, whatever you want to call it. But we, we forget that our own consciousness needs to be raised. Because we are a product of capitalism. We are a product of a lot of times weak movements. We haven't had clarity in a very, very long time. Let's not pretend that we know everything, because we don't. People still have a lot to teach us. We need to be organized, and we need new, co new experiences to bring new consciousness. We finally got the chance during Occupy to see massive spontaneous movements. It wasn't everything we hoped for. It wasn't all it was cracked out to be, but it was something that was desperately needed. And this is where I discovered that I lacked consciousness. <laughs> I wasn't really excited about it at first. I was like, oh great, middle class people angry about get money out of politics, whatever. I'm like, what is this with this stupid slogan where the 99%, clearly that's not Marxist. <laughs> it's not my fault. I was trained on very pessimistic sectarian traditions. <laughs> Consciousness developed linearly, like, you know, you're conservative, you sign a petition, you go on strike, you know, revolution. <laughs> I'm laughing at myself. On <laughs> so I understand where some of the pessimism comes from. We're not so open to new forms all the time or often. Most people haven't seen people transform. And to see someone who refuses, like as a union organizer, to open a door to even speak with me, <coughs> and then see that same person eight months later challenging the boss, I've seen that, you know? And, and a lot of people haven't had that experience. But that only happened because there were dedicated workers who were willing to sustain that struggle to give her that chance to have that consciousness. very quickly during the Occupy. But then they saw the same people, it's conscious evaporate, and reaction comes with a vengeance and consolidates the hegemony again. That's very disappointing. But neither of these situations are permanent because consciousness isn't linear. One moment, people are living in the park, sharing their last meal, talking about how to overthrow capitalism, and a few months later, they could be thinking about how they go into medical school and justify voting for Obama. <laughs> moment that raised their consciousness wasn't brief and wasn't sustained. People can make leaps forward or backwards in a year. Do we hopelessly submit to this spontaneous process, or do we build an organization capable of sustaining new ruptures tears, spontaneous riots, whatever you want to call it, long enough to create more militants that can then sustain an even greater battle against capitalism. A new situation, new militants, intense warfare, much more than we have experienced. And it will come, revolutionary politics will take root in the people. This is something that will happen, but we need organization and strategy to actually carry that out. And it will take root in women, who well, hopefully will be here up here more with me. <laughs> so I think a lot of our 
problems stem from this critical mistrust of the people. Because like I said earlier, we're all dreamers, we enter and there's a lot of disappointment, so we think that the truth means that people aren't capable. But we may not even articulate this to ourselves, but our actions speak that. And because we don't really trust the people, we are wedded to our egos, our sects, our identities, and because of the satisfaction or validation of that is something tangible, if I win this fight with you, I get to satisfy my ego, seems more palatable than actual revolution, guess what? I'm probably gonna go that ego route. <laughs> but actually, if you believe in the capacity of mass amounts of people protesting, of striking, of mobilizing, rioting, whatever the forms, that satisfaction, that will override all your petty desires. You know? But you really have to check yourself and even critique yourself. What am I speaking right now? Why am I talking? Am I trying to please these you know, opportunistic career tendencies of mine? Or am I actually trying to fight to actually overthrow capitalism? And if you realize that you're not here to overthrow capitalism, but you really just like these petty things, then you're not a revolutionary. And this is such We cannot form an organization with non-revolutionaries. We can't have a strategy with them. So maybe our first point of unity should be, do you believe that revolution is possible? Do you believe that people can overthrow this sadistic regime, sadistic system, social relation? Then we can enter in good faith into debate. And then we can talk about strategy. Until then, we can't have that conversation. We have to understand that people are here because they really believe in this. <clears throat> what I'm really pleased about is that some collectives, like um, Black Orchid Collective Advanced the Struggle, are attempting to create spaces. And Kusama has already created a space for people to have comradely debate in good faith with real revolutionaries. And so that brings me to another point. So we have the trust of the people. Excellent. And some of you might be wondering, then why do we need organization and strategy? If people come do it. <clears throat> well, I'm going to rephrase Fanon, and I'm going to butcher it terribly, and I apologize. But the system is inherently built in with violence, because it knows, because the, the ruling class knows that the people can do it, that we can overthrow it. This is why it is built in with violence. And so, without strategy, without organization, we will not be able to advance. Or if we do, we may have high casualties. Or because we, we might advance in one point, but may not be able to in other points. We have to be, have some people who are dedicated to learning about past experiences and learning about the, the kind of unleashing of terror that we have witnessed <coughs> and that we are witnessing now and I think it'll just get worse. And if we don't learn from these things, if we do not take the master's plan, you know, of, into account, of our own strategy, of our own organization, we will not be able to develop. And most people, there will be too many sacrifices of the people without those kind of militants intervening. <clears throat> and at the same time, we need a strategy that takes into account what the ruling class, the capitalists, are planning on how they are reformatting <coughs> industry, how they are, the way they are slicing up social services to actual you know, employee benefits, pay, all of that, how they're restructuring all these things, where they're going, how they're doing it. We need to study that. So we know where to go. We know where the key industries are and what's gonna happen in that. Or we know what parts of the section of the country are more susceptible to be able to fight back or not. You know, we need the legitimate summation of struggle and of the last decades. And we need to also read the ruling class papers <laughs> to figure out what they're thinking, what they're doing. 
And actually, the person that taught me that is sitting right here. <laughs> that was my coach. <laughs> I really realized how repressive the U.S. is when I went outside of the U.S. I'm in Greece. I went to Greece a month ago. And I had these... I couldn't even believe it. They're like, they had this like we don't pay movement where people like didn't pay to ride the metro and they didn't pay the toll booths. So they just like removed the you know the bar. And I'm like, <laughs> cool. So I came back and I was like, yeah. So how I'm gonna do this in Marta, in you know, Atlanta? And I'm looking at it. And I'm like, okay. There's a cop at every like, <laughs> like turnstile and there's like these like. I, like, you can get hit if you don't move in two seconds and everything's locked down and you go to jail and you won't be, you know, maybe not get billed out until like 40 hours later if you go to the wrong jail and like on and on and on. I'm like, in Greece, they didn't even have like doors. You know, you just like literally were like, if you don't want to pay, you don't pay. People had apparently internalized it and paid it anyway before that moment. I'm like, really? Like, <laughs> so. There are these things like that really are materially holding us back from having certain types of struggles. And the price to pay for the, even the smallest violation of the law is too high. It's just not worth it. I'm right now in a court battle because I shut down Chase Bank. And I'm like... <laughs> you know, like, I don't know, I may get two years in jail for that. Hopefully not. You know, we have a pro bono lawyer, all that stuff, right? But still, that's a serious risk. I also have a child. And that could be used against me to take my, my son away. This is a country of laws. They have, like, no, like, informal relationship without law here. It's not the same thing in a lot of countries where you can just do a lot of things and only when you come together in like, you know, in squares and stuff, the cops are very repressive, let's not forget that. But it's a different kind of repression. Like more people are in jail here than anywhere else. I feel like we don't really concentrate on how they are creating uh, a place where resistance is becoming impossible. You have to think about that. You know, in Greece, again, in universities, cops cannot enter the university. Okay. So these people lock their professors in, and we're like, well, we're be occupying right now, and they like pretty much took them like a hostage, you know? And they're like, oh my god, the cops came on the campus, like this was terrible. And they're like, yeah, you know, now we're trying to work it out. I may get expelled. It's like, can you imagine if like I shut down Georgia State with professors in a room? Like I would be like like terrorist, like hostage situation. Like I would go to jail for like. 20 years, 30 years, something's like insane. It's like a totally different world, you know? And that's making us have, you know, less sort of militancy in some areas and closing off certain, certain like avenues. <laughs> so I want us to think like, what is our first line of action? Should we even prioritize? Or how do we go after this treacherous police state? Should we think about that? Should a certain wing of militants dedicate all their organize against that? So then the other militants can actually be more successful. And that's like, I want to end with that. And again, thank you so much for having me here.